A man on horseback, a stranger obscured by a hooded cloak, travels the muddied causeways leading through the center of the small hamlet. He dismounts and approaches the town bulletin where news is posted. Tragic missing persons and sightings of unnatural abominations coat the board. The stranger rips a paper sheet and folds it into his pocket before adjusting the blade sheathed across his back. Wisps of stark white hair sway in the breeze from under his cowl. The villagers retreat to their homes and bar their doors, for the man is a witcher, a monster hunter. A witcher is doom and evil, and the people will never be safe. Even if he's successful, there is one monster a witcher can't slay, that which resides within. Hey lore lovers, my name's Eric and welcome to the Lorebarians YouTube channel, where we share the lore and stories behind many fantasy settings to strengthen the connection between people and their passions. Today we'll tackle the story of Geralt of Rivia and seek to dispel the myths surrounding the famous White Wolf and protagonist of Andrzej Sapkowski's Witcher novel series. This video is meant to be as spoiler free as possible, so I'll remain brief and omit the fine details or major plotlines of the series. A huge thanks to all of my supporters over on Patreon. Their patronage means the world to me and helps the channel grow and improve. And if you're interested in joining the Lore Luminaries, check us out on patreon.com slash the Lorebarians. To gain access to me, get video drops a day early, other cool perks, and to join a growing community that shares your passion for lore. The support is much appreciated. Alright, time to don our wolfhead medallion and prepare our signs as we uncover the skills and stories of Geralt of Rivia. Let's dive in. Geralt is a witcher, a genetically mutated and magically enhanced swordmaster whose existence has but one purpose, to slay the myriad abominations and monsters left after the conjunction of the spheres that slink through the darkness of the continent and prey on hapless villagers. Of common birth and trained at the legendary witcher fortress of Kaer Morhen, Geralt spends his days traveling the path and seeking coin by hunting monsters and lifting curses. He's earned more than wealth through his travels. Fame and notoriety precede the White Wolf, as tales of his heroics flow through the inns and the roads crisscrossing the northern kingdoms. Like all witchers, Geralt is equipped with both the knowledge and tools necessary to subdue his supernatural foes. Armed with a massive blade and silver-studded gauntlets, Geralt carries around his neck a wolfhead medallion that's attuned to the unnatural and alerts him of monstrous or magical threats. The Witcher also utilizes simple spells known as signs to help overcome his enemies. Due to his training and mutations, Geralt has superhuman strength, speed, agility, and stamina, attributes that are bolstered after imbibing one of many Witcher decoctions he carries in vials. So great is his physical prowess that Geralt has been known to deflect arrows mid-flight and even cleave through hurtled flames of magic with his dwarven maid Sahil. Perhaps the Witcher's most reliable tool is his mount and traveling companion on the path, the valiant steed Roach. Geralt names each of his horses Roach and occasionally converses with them to break the silence and lonely existence. Even though his actions protect humanity, Geralt, like all Witchers, is scorned by humans. They see him as a mutant, an ugly spawn of witchcraft and experimentation, worthy only of mistrust and contempt. He's believed to be something less than a human, a creature without emotion who cares only for gold and blood. Though their scrutiny is harsh, a kernel of truth rings clear. Most witchers are left impassive and detached by their training and the mutations performed on them. But Geralt underwent changed experiments, and this alteration may have only deepened his strong convictions, where other witchers became apathetic. Yes, on the surface Geralt is stoic and indifferent. A witcher would quickly fall to occupational hazards if he allowed emotions to rule. But the White Wolf often shows great concern for those who've earned his trust, respect, or love. He's very protective of and loyal to his friends, and is prepared to travel through the fires of hell and back for their safety. Chiefly, the troubadour Dandelion, his heart's prize the sorceress Yennefer of Vengeberg, and his adoptive daughter Princess Cirilla of Sintra. Despite taking coin to slay all manner of monsters, Geralt is adamant in staying his hand with respect to humans and non-humans alike. On several occasions, his services are solicited to assassinate a political rival, track down a sentient and peaceful creature, or slaughter groups of the elder races, 
and he steadfastly refuses. In a world where tensions simmer between humans and the elder races, where a small scuffle could spark widespread violence and terrible pogroms, the Witcher's deeds and convictions allow him to effectively cross the hateful discrimination between human and non-human, earning the respect of both. Philavandrel of the Elves, Yarpin Zigrin and the Mahakam Dwarves, even dragons in the Dryads of Brokolon, who call him Gwynbleed, admire the Witcher for defending them and choosing mercy when navigating tense situations. The humans of the continent appreciate Geralt's strong moral code and faithfulness in keeping his word, but maintain a safe distance from the mutant, whom they whisper about just beyond earshot. The Witcher is also resolute in his political neutrality, which paradoxically only draws him deeper into the web of intrigue and conflict cast over the continent. Despite making a living as a killer, Geralt often avoids violence and minimizes bloodshed, resorting to brute force only after having exhausted all other efforts. This quickly earns him the trust and confidence of people as noble as King Fultist of Temeria and Queen Meave of Lyria and Rivia, who try to use his expertise to further their own causes. For all of his desires to remain out of politics and the machinations of countries, much of Geralt's immortal story unfolds within the layers of plots between Nordlings and Nilfgaardians, a story that we must learn if we are to gain a greater appreciation of the legendary White Wolf of Rivia. Geralt's tale begins in 1173, when he's born to the warrior Corin and the sorceress Visenna. Corin was described as a swashbuckling adventurer whom Geralt never met. His mother was a druid and healer that serviced the local area. Geralt's childhood was quickly turned upside down when Visenna abandoned the boy on the road outside the infamous Witcher seat of Kaer Morhen. He was discovered by the Witcher Vesemir, who took Geralt in and offered the boy a chance at life, if Geralt could survive the brutal trial of the grasses and become a Witcher himself. The two would grow to share a bond as strong as one between father and son. The order of Witchers took on many like Geralt, the orphans of society, the refuse of the world, those whose death would not be missed, and indoctrinated them in cohorts in the codes of the Witcher. The path to becoming a skilled monster slayer is perilous. It begins with grueling physical and mental conditioning, and ends with the ingestion of mutagenic agents and subjection to magical experiments. The trial of the grasses is known to kill nearly 9 out of 10 young boys who undertake it. Geralt showed brilliant potential in swordplay and had an innate resistance or tolerance for many of the mutagens in the trial, which piqued the interest of his trainers. This subjected the boy to stronger mutations and harsher magic. Though Geralt emerged with his life, the transformation left his hair stark white, the hallmark trait that earned him the moniker White Wolf. Further experimentation also blessed him with quicker reflexes, stronger muscles, and sharper senses than even other witchers. Geralt emerged as the sole survivor from his cohort, when the years of rigorous training ended with him taking on the mantle of witcher. But witchers aren't merely trained as simple blades. They're also given a complete education on the nature of monsters, of herbs and potions, and superstitions and folklore. The knowledge gained at Kaer Morhen assists Geralt in tracking his prey and surviving confrontations with the horde beasts that lurk in the darkness. With the completion of their training, new witchers are instructed to fabricate a surname and background to disarm the humans who despise them, to build a layer of trustworthiness and authenticity so that they may dispel fear within human communities and take up contracts to sustain their livelihood. Geralt initially names himself Geralt Roger Eric Duhat Bellegard, a gallant and haughty name that will more surely earn him a knife in the back than a coin purse. The level-headed Vesemir proposes a different name and the two settle on Geralt of Rivia, a small country to which he has no ties. At once, Geralt leaves the fortress of Kaer Morhen to begin his career as a witcher and his first season on the trail. The youthful and energetic witcher, eager to slay evil and protect the innocent, comes upon his first opportunity not 50 furlongs from Kaer Morhen, when Geralt stumbles across a group of men harassing a peasant cart. They hold an old man down and prepare to rape his daughter. Filled with righteous purpose, Geralt sees within the men his first monsters to slay. 
he kills the abuser and saves the young girl. But rather than earning gratitude, the Witcher's acts are seen as slaughter, gaining only fear and hatred. This quickly douses the bright flame of knightly honor within the Witcher, and Geralt resigns himself to his fate. A mutant, greedy for coin and wanting for nothing but blood. The Witcher's early travels leave him jaded, and he slowly retreats within himself, beneath a layer of stoic indifference and casual coolness. But his skills in combat also earn him a reputation as an effective monster slayer as words of his deeds quickly spread across the continent. A man possessed by the devil who fights without fear and kills all manner of unnatural beasts. For years, Geralt walks the trail, taking contracts from spring to autumn, then wintering in Kaer Morhen and sharing tales with other witchers, only to set about once more with the first snowmelt. Geralt's indifference is challenged when the Witcher arrives in the frigid northern town of Blaviken for a monster contract, but instead finds himself thrust in the middle of a young woman's quest for bloody retribution. Renfri, a disinherited princess, has traveled to Blaviken with a troop of armed men to kill the sorcerer Stregobor, the man responsible for ruining her life. Renfri was born during an eclipse and the mage believes her to be a mutant creature born of pure evil. He attempts to have her killed or captured, but to no avail, and now Renfri is in Blaviken to repay the favor. Geralt is caught between the combatants and forced to choose between two evils when he takes up sword against Renfri and her men during the busy market day in Blaviken Square. The Witcher slays the princess and the armed forces, protecting the townsfolk from further bloodshed, but all the villagers see is a madman a mutant that murdered a dozen. He's cast out, earning nothing but the title Butcher of Blaviken. This tale is given to us in the Last Wish story, The Lesser Evil, and the first episode of season one in Netflix, The Witcher. Though the massacre at Blaviken besmirches the Witcher's reputation, the flames of Geralt's fame and notoriety are fanned by the troubadour dandelion to burn across the continent. Named Julian Alfred Pankratz, or Yaskir, the Viscount of Leitenhof, is a bard, poet, and traveling minstrel whom Geralt meets during a feast in Adern. The two form an unusual but strong friendship in which Dandelion spreads word of Geralt's deeds through poetry and prose, while the Witcher often saves the bard from angry husbands victimized by Yaskir's philandering. Geralt's life and career act as a wellspring of inspiration for Dandelion, who embellishes the adventures the pair undergo, transforming them into ballads and legends worthy of the high courts of the northern kingdoms. In truth, Yaskir is responsible for the Witcher's ascension to legend, a hero that survives the ages. Geralt continues to seek contracts and earn coin until his travels send him hurtling into the path of a woman who will forever change his life. Yennefer of Vangaberg, a sorceress whose limitless ambition drives her to seek further power, first meets Geralt while attempting to trap and use a djinn to fulfill her desires. Though ultimately unsuccessful, in part due to Geralt's intervention, a spark flashes between the two that quickly ignites the fires of passion. The Witcher's cold indifference and the sorceress's cruel selfishness melt as the pair open their hearts and find wounded, kindred spirits in one another. Yennefer remains Geralt's lover throughout his story, but the two are destined to forever be apart. Their relationship is characteristically hot and cold, one that's halted for long periods of time as the pair travel apart or anger another only to resume at a fever pitch after apologies and forgiveness are exchanged. Yennefer solidifies her standing in the Witcher's life when the two assume the roles of adoptive parents to a child that turns Geralt's destiny on its head. Geralt's days as the White Wolf Witcher are numbered when he invokes the Law of Surprise. This centuries-old tradition dictates that a man saved by another is expected to offer to his savior a boon whose nature is unknown to one or both parties. Geralt saves the life of the cursed knight Duni, lover of Princess Pavetta in the feast halls of Sintra. 
He jumps to the man's defense when Queen Calanthe orders her guards to slay the monstrosity. The Witcher is offered the Law of Surprise as recompense for his actions, which delivers onto him a child. The child of destiny and possessor of elder blood, Princess Cirilla of Sintra. After the sacking of Sintra by the Nilfgaardian Empire which leaves Ciri scarred and without her family, Geralt casts aside much of his Witcher ways to raise Ciri as his own. The Witcher novels follow Geralt's adventures as he returns to Kaer Morhen to train Cirilla in the Witcher arts. But Ciri is wanted by the Northern Kings, the Emperor of Nilfgaard, and even the NL Elves for her role in Ithlian's prophecy. Cirilla and her progeny have the power to save the earth from the white frost and wolfish blizzard, or condemn it to die under the glaciers of Ted the Red. Geralt and Yennefer go to great lengths to protect Ciri and maintain secrecy, but the trio are separated after the Thanad coup and beginning of the Second Northern War between the Nordlings and Nilfgaardian Empire. The novels follow closely Geralt's sojourn to save Cirilla, and he gathers about him a peculiar fellowship consisting of Dandelion, a Nilfgaardian deserter, dwarves, huntswomen, and even a greater vampire. Geralt stops at nothing to rescue Ciri and Yennefer from the clutches of evil, putting his sword skills and supernatural abilities to the test on his journey to save his family. There is no fairy tale ending for Geralt of Rivia. Although he succeeds and rescues his family from certain death at the end of the earth, happiness is as elusive as peace. A man, who lives by the sword is doomed to die by the sword. The Witcher finds himself caught in a horrible massacre as violence sweeps across the town of Rivia. The xenophobic humans take up arms against the non-human races dwelling within when a small altercation conflagrates into a brutal pogrom where hundreds of elves and dwarves are murdered. Geralt's sense of justice and honor compel him to defend his dwarven companions. The Witcher takes to the streets and slays dozens of human rioters, but is himself finally struck down by the masses. The book entitled The Rivian Pogrom in the Witcher video game series summarizes the events. It claims that Geralt, known as the White Wolf, died during a massacre of non-humans. The pogrom took place in the city of Rivia just after the second war with Nilfgaard. Geralt was killed by an angry mob when he tried to defend the oppressed. The sorceress Triss Marigold and the dwarf Zoltan Chevet witnessed his death. The Witcher's body was never found. Geralt's character entry in The Witcher 2 Assassin of Kings further expounds on the fate of the Witcher. You must know that Geralt of Rivia died once already, or at least everyone thought him dead. During a massacre in Rivia, he sought to defend non-humans and fell to overwhelming odds. Placed in a boat, he floated into the mist, into a realm where he finally found peace, but not for long. And this is where the events of the novel's transition to the Witcher video game series by CD Projekt Red, where the eponymous hero Geralt of Rivia unites with his friends and loved ones to fight monsters, men, and the forces of evil that attempt to once more abuse Ciri, the child of elder blood, for their own purposes. The White Wolf of Rivia's life and acts are immortalized in Dandelion's autobiography, A Half Century of Poetry, and the legend of the Witcher and Ciri are passed down through the centuries in many of the bard's ballads and poems. Geralt, the legendary Witcher of Kaer Morhen, whose blades have tasted the blood of myriad monsters and men alike, a man, destiny has thrust into the eye of countless storms around which kingdoms and countries swirl. A man, forever joined to his child surprise through the invisible but most powerful forces in the world, and who will travel to the ends of the earth to ensure her safety. A man, a mutant, who is slowed by nothing and leaves evil defeated in his wake, has carved for himself a generous place in the history of the continent. His legend survives the endless march of time. Thanks so much for watching and listening to this video on Geralt of Rivia. Now I wanna hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on Geralt, the white wolf in the comments. Is he a hero, a villain, or just woefully misunderstood? As well as suggestions for future videos. 
And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, consider subscribing to the channel or checking out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. Again, a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters who make all of this possible. I couldn't do it without their spectacular patronage. If you're interested in becoming a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, and early video drops, check out the link below or head to patreon.com slash the lorebarians to learn more. Special thanks to script editor Kenan Orhan and Alex Joaquim for the intro and outro music. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.